Welcome to Sex is Medicine, your number one resource for holistic sex education. I'm Davy Ward Erickson, and I invite you to join me every week for another enriching and powerful conversation about the intersection of sexuality, spirituality, pleasure, and personal growth. Each episode of Sex is Medicine is dedicated to awakening your heart and mind to the true purpose and power of human sexuality. Please join me on this journey of self-discovery as we explore the art of using pleasure as medicine to awaken, heal, and empower every area of your life. Sex is Medicine broadcasts every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on Contact Talk Radio Network. You can listen to the replay and subscribe to Sex is Medicine on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And now get ready for another episode of Sex is Medicine. Welcome to Sex is Medicine, your number one resource for holistic sex education. I am your hostess with a mostess, Miss Davy Ward Erickson, and I am delighted to have you here for another delicious and enriching episode. This is kind of the, this is the best medicine we can take. Sex is medicine. Uh, my guest this evening is Christine Do, Do, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Could you could you pronounce that for me, please? Sure, Christine Delosier. Delosier, that was it. I always want to make it more compliment than it is, complicated than it is. Christine Delosier, who is a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, acupuncturist, and herbalist, and she has published a new book called Diet for Better Sex. Is that correct? Diet for Great Sex. Diet for great sex, not even better, <laughs> but for great sex, <laughs> that's even better. Um, and so we're going to talk about that book and we're going to talk about how diet, what we eat, the foods we eat and how we eat them and when they eat them can enhance our sex lives or detract from our sex lives. Um, so Christine, you, how did you get into traditional Chinese medicine? What inspired you to start uh, uh, exploring that and training in that and practicing that? You know, I've always been rather obsessed with a natural approach to health, you know, whether it's through food, through lifestyle, I always felt like, you know, nature is the answer in most cases, you know, and I, I do acknowledge that, you know, Western medicine, um, uh, biomedicine definitely has its place. But I always feel like, let's try this first, you know what I mean? This, this, as far as treating the root of good health, I feel like, you know, sticking to uh, the biological design of the human body is is first and foremost. And so when I discovered just how much traditional Chinese medicine was able to accomplish without the use of pharmaceuticals, um, without, you know, some of those, um, the, the, the more aggressive interventions that can have the more serious side effects, that sort of thing. Um, I was so impressed with it that I wanted to pursue a career in it. And so what then, then, you know, of course we get down, you know, down the, the rabbit hole, so to speak. And, you know, most acupuncturists specialize at least to some degree in, you know, neck pain, back pain, headaches, things like that, because that's what insurance companies will cover. Uh, one day, one of my patients came in and he asked me if I could do anything to help him have stronger erections. And I said, well, we can give it a try. It's not something I've treated before. And so we, he had such good results he was impressed. I was impressed. And especially since that's something that's, that can be really difficult to treat, um, you know, even in you know, Western medicine, even pharmacologically. So then I had a few more patients after that who got great results. So I decided, you know what, let's, um, I wanted to specialize in that. So I, I do specialize in sexual health. And when I work with my patients, being the foodie that I am being kind of uh, rather obsessed, if you will, with um, with nutrition and food and, um, you know, and, and, and that, I always ask my patients what they eat and try to incorporate a dietary approach, you know, to, to help support their, their treatment goals. And of course, I look at this from a traditional lens. And I also look at it from a biomedical lens. You know, I, I trained uh, as an undergraduate, I trained to be a research scientist. So I kind of wove in both 
you know, scientific research, nutritional research, medical research, and traditional Chinese medicine into this book. And so it kind of, we take a look at how um, the food we eat affects the qi and affects the movement of qi and blood. And we also take a look at how it affects our nerves, how it affects our, you know, our, our vascular system, how it affects our hormones. Yeah, I love that. And I, I am of the of the same mind, obviously, given the title of my show, Sex is Medicine, um, that that holistic therapies and and and, and supporting health, as opposed to uh, waiting for a disease or an illness to manifest and then treating the symptom. We want to treat the human mechanism as a whole and support healthy functioning so that disease doesn't occur. And that's what I love about Eastern medicine is it's really about focus, focusing on finding the root cause of the dysfunction and, and perceiving and viewing illness through the lens of by the time it expresses physically, that's just a symptom. So, so let's find out what's causing that symptom and address it at the root to correct it at the root. Um, and that's, that's what I love about Eastern healing traditions. And of course, Western medicine has its place, you know, like if I have an issue with my heart that needs to be repaired, I'm going to want to have the surgery to repair that. And I'm also going to want to use food and supplements and energy medicine to support my body in healing and recovering from that type of, um, the type of trauma. So I love that. I love your orientation to that. So it sounds like you, you decided you made the, the, the choice to really hone in on sexual functioning because of this gap in the field of acupuncture that, that, that doesn't necessarily include or specialize or even address sexual issues. And so um, uh, the, the focus for you though, in your book, as we said, is less about acupuncture and more about diet. Um, so you talk about the trifecta of great sex in terms of diet. Could you tell us all about that? What does that mean for you? So, you know, when we think of great sex, we typically think of it as a psychological phenomenon, you know, the right person, the right mood, the right time, the right moment. But physiologically, it's when our nerves are firing strong, rapid impulses. It's when the chi is strong, you know, the chi, you know, in many ways, does represent our nerve function. Every time a nerve fires, we see the movement of chi. So it's when our nerves are firing strong, rapid impulses. It's when our sex hormones are balanced and it's when our blood vessels are delivering optimal blood flow. That's the trifecta of great sex. And that is, you know, we, we all know that males need adequate blood flow for great sex, for just for, you know, any sex. But most people don't realize females need blood flow too and diet very much affects uh, blood flow in the short term and in the long term you know there are even foods for example that will immediately dilate blood vessels measurably you know enough to measure it in the laboratory and there are foods that will constrict blood vessels in the short term as well so you can you can see that if you're planning for a date night you know you definitely don't want to eat certain things that are going to have that, you know, that short-term um, stiffening and, and you can encourage foods that have um, that, that make them more elastic and uh, allow those blood vessels to deliver more blood flow. But, um, you know, we can talk about that in more detail, but yes, that's the trifecta of great sex and food affects this in every way. It affects it again in the short term, it affects it in the long term. And for, you know, to optimize this, you know, trifecta of great sex, we need to um, maintain a lifestyle um, in our eating choices that, um, that promotes, uh, you know, the health in this area. I love it. And I love that you mentioned engorgement because the people with vulvas and vaginas have more erectile tissue internally than a, than a, than a penis owner has externally. So engorgement is even more of an issue for us. And it takes, you know, up to 45 minutes to get fully engorged. So if we have any hitches in that blood flow giddy up, uh, that's going to be problematic. Uh, so I love that you mentioned that. So, so what are some what are some foods if you can think of off the top of your head that will support the the flow of blood that will increase blood flow that will increase engorgement so uh, the absolute best thing that you could probably eat for great sex in general not only for engorgement but also for you know nerves and, and sex hormones are leaves you know so let, let's think about humans for a second um, and our dietary choices, our food choices. You know, other animals instinctively know what is healthy for them. They know what to, to nourish their health. Um, they know which 
berries, which plants, which animals to consume. But humans have kind of lost our way and we rely on you know, each other to tell us what to eat. Ex experts and, and experts can't agree on this. But if you look at other primates, you know, well, humans are primates. If you look at other primates, you know, they eat a whole lot of leaves and they eat a lot of berries. They, they, in doing so, they get many times the amount of fiber in their diets, many times the amount of um, minerals like magnesium, potassium, uh, calcium. And all of these um, are excellent for this trisecta of great sex, but in particular to blood flow, leafy greens are high in, in naturally occurring nitrates, which promote vascular health. They, in the short term, they dilate blood vessels and they're also high in potassium, which again, nourishes vascular health. You know, human beings used to take in about 10 times the amount of potassium in their diet as sodium. Now it's just the opposite. We take in about 10 times as much sodium as potassium and this wreaks havoc on our blood vessels. You know, potassium softens this delicate inner lining of blood vessels, and it also offsets the damaging effects of, of salt. So for great blood flow, that's probably my number one choice. But in addition to that, it's got loads of antioxidants to speed nerve conduction. It's got, um, it even, you know, leafy greens have nutrients which reduce cortisol levels. And cortisol, um, as you know, is a stress hormone, and it can disrupt testosterone, which is going to definitely um, affect our libido and, and other aspects of sexual function. So leafy greens. So is, does that look like, you know, like how much leafy greens? Are we only eating leafy greens or like a salad a day or two salads <laughs> a day or a salad before sex? Or how, what does that look like practically? <laughs> Okay, so practically it, it means getting regular leaves in your diet. Um, what, what I recommend to my patients is if you wanna have a huge impact on your diet um, and you wanna start with a, a small change, try changing lunch. Uh, try to, at least when you go to work every week, every day, uh, bring a nice big leafy grain salad and then bring something like a baked yam with the skin on it because you're gonna, in that one meal, you're gonna get about half of your daily potassium and you're going to get um, all of the other benefits that we talked about, about the leafy greens as well. So that's a great way. You can really boost your nutritional, um, you know, vitamin and mineral intake just by that one meal every day. Sounds like potassium is kind of like the secret sauce when it comes to uh, erectile functioning. Yeah, potassium is big. It's a, it's a big player. And again, uh, potassium showed in research to have an immediate effect on blood vessels too. So one high potassium meal within a couple hours of eating it measurably improved arterial function. So you get a little bit better blood flow, uh, you know, in the short term as well. Wonderful. So in terms of diet, are, is there like a general just kind of overview about how diet affects our sex life? Like we talk specifically about engorgement, but what are some other uh, ways in which what we eat and what we're putting in our body can either enhance or impede our sexuality? So another big one is nerve conduction and how quickly our nerves fire, how strongly they fire to and from the genitals affects pleasure. You know, so when the clitoris is stimulated when, or when the penis or clitoris is stimulated, how much direct pleasure we feel, how much direct arousal response we experience from touch depends very much on how quickly those nerves are firing. And um, we might not think that you know, if we don't have a diagnosis like diabetic neuropathy or something that's affecting our nerves, we might think we're okay, but that's not really the case. Um, when patients increase their antioxidants, their, their nerves will fire stronger, more rapid impulses because those nerves are protected from oxidative damage. And so we get uh, a better, um, you know, more pleasure when we have, when we have those in our diet. Antioxidants. So there we go. Our antioxidant smoothies at the health food store. Like who knew that that was going to allow my clitoris to be more sensitive. I didn't know that. <laughs> Your acai berries are, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so acai, spinach, everything. Yeah. All those. So acai, spinach and all that. So vitamin C antioxidant, like, so just like, like everything that we're hearing about antioxidants that is going to support and enhance and improve our sexual functioning. Absolutely. So the, your best bets, you know, your superstars are things like the acai berries, um, blueberries, spinach. Those are really packed with antioxidants. But even things like, you know, vitamin A, you just, you know, and like you said, vitamin C, they're both very powerful antioxidants, which speed nerve conduction. 
Another really great one to incorporate in, in your diet for antioxidants is mushrooms. There's a lot more attention being paid to mushrooms and just how kind of amazing they are to overall health. But in particular, they're great for sexual health because they nourish this entire trifecta of great sex. They're loaded with antioxidants. And the coolest thing about mushrooms is that they operate on our microbiome. Um, so in research, they were shown to actually improve um, the, di the diversity of our microbiome and, and raise populations of healthy bacteria, reduce populations of pathogenic bacteria um, or other microbes. And so um, that was the coolest thing. And this was across the board. Like they studied, there were like nine different mushrooms that I looked at that there was actually um, research to support that it actually affected the microbiome, which was so cool. And so um, in doing so, we, you got benefit um, to nerve function, but also benefit to the cardiovascular system and uh, as well as hormonal health as well. So is this just like your regular kind of little button mushrooms you can buy at the store in bulk kind of thing? Even white button mushrooms showed um, in research to improve the, the biodiversity of your microbiome. So yes, even the simple white mushrooms that are the cheap ones. You know, if you get fancy, like something like lion's mane, lion's mane is a superstar for nerves in particular. And it was shown in several studies to even, you know, help regenerate nerves and, and really, you know, really help uh, repair damage to nerves, especially. In terms of mushrooms, so is, is will, we, will we get the same effects if we cook them or should we be eating them raw? You can, yeah, you can cook them. Yeah, no problem at all. Or if you don't like mushrooms, you can take a supplement um, or you can even drink your mushrooms. There's something called chaga mushrooms. I don't know if you've ever tried those. But, I haven't um, tried that, but I think I've heard of it. Oh, oh they're, they're delicious. It, it grows on the bark of birch trees and it's this, um, it looks like this woody, these woody chunks, you boil them and they have this really lovely vanilla flavor and aroma. And they were used in World War II as a coffee substitute because they have such a pleasant flavor and they turn the water the same color as coffee. So you can have it with some spices and you can make yourself a little uh, chai latte with, with your mushrooms and it tastes delicious with a little honey, a little almond milk and, and some you know cloves and fennel, nutmeg. And it's, it's really wonderful. That sounds like a lovely aphrodisiac. <laughs> yeah, well, it's definitely a, an antioxidant powerhouse. Wow. And so are all these mushrooms in your book? There are. Yeah, there's a whole chapter on mushrooms. Awesome. This sounds like an amazing book. So in terms of diet, is, are there any things that we as vulva owners uh, need to be especially mindful of? Like how does diet specifically affect the health and functioning of, uh, of us of, as vulva owners? Well, you know, surprisingly, the, the mechanism by which our diet affects sex was fairly similar across vulva owners as well as penis owners, um, because we're talking about the same, you know, the same, uh, the same mechanism. So the arteries in the clitoris and, and in the penis are among the smallest in the body. And what happens with those is they, they are the first to show blockage. So when there's plaque accumulation, those are the first to get blocked. And so sexual dysfunction is one of the first signs of cardiovascular disease. So we want to promote the free flow of that blood, the free flow of chi. And um, that's the same, you know, that's the same for male and female sexual, sexual health. And um, again, balancing hormones. So for the optimal hormone levels are different for each person, you know, so, so uh, females typically uh, for sexual function do better with higher estrogen levels and lower, but you know, testosterone is equally as important, but just in lower amounts and it's opposite for, um, for male sexual function. But um, promoting that balance is the same. You know, it's, uh, our, our diets affect that. And, you know, there are certain things that we want to do to maintain those, those hormone levels. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that particularly for Yoni owners uh, or vulva owners, different stages of life are going to require different kinds of diet. So for instance, as we move into menopause, our, our hormonal needs are going to be different than when we're in our 20s and 30s. Yeah, it is, you know, but the thing about it is, yes and no. As we go through menopause, um, we, we can, a lot of that hit hormonal disruption can be 
offset by kind of acting early and, you know, making sure you take in lots of antioxidants, making sure that you're having like a very um, fruit and vegetable heavy diet, you know, that sort of thing. So it can definitely ease the transition with, with menopause for sure. Okay. So preventative. So before we even get to menopause, ensuring that our diet is high, we're doing this whole trifecta thing, which is not just going to improve our sex life, but it's going to improve our overall life. It sounds like, so yeah. So, so, so doing it early preventative as opposed to trying to antidote it later. Exactly. Yep. Yep. They're always looking towards treating the root. Yeah. So here we're talking about some things that support sexual functioning. What are foods that are just awful? Like it's like you don't want to eat these or ingest these because it's like the pathway to sexual hell for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and, and we've all experienced it, you know, indulged in the, the diet for bad sex, if you, if you will. Um, <laughs> bad sex. <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, think about it. Date night, you know, date night. We've got, oh, fettuccine Alfredo. We've got the creme brulee. We've got, you know, so we've got a meal that's loaded with fat, loaded with sugar, loaded with salt. And, you know, those are the three top ones that both in the short and long term. So a high fat, a really fatty, greasy meal will tank your testosterone in the short term. So it's definitely not good for getting busy that night. And, also, it'll measurably stiffen blood vessels. Um, the same with salt. Salt, within 30 minutes of eating a really salty meal, blood vessels are measurably stiffened. Uh, let me see. Sugar uh, definitely will you'll experience a, a dip in testosterone, but also sugar disrupts hormones in, you know, in, your, in the long term and in your, you know, for overall health as well. So definitely want to stick, stay clear of those. But the cool thing about, um, about that is that Certain fats, like omega-3 fats, actually had the opposite effect on blood vessels. So they measurably improved the elasticity of blood vessels, even within a couple hours of eating them. Wow. So it depends on the type of fat. And yeah, and I hear you, like after the fettuccine Alfredo and creme brulee, like you just want to go home and go to sleep. You <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> all my energies and digestion. I don't have a lot left for <laughs> anything else. So, so fat, like uh, the wrong kind of fat. So, so um, uh, the, the, I can't remember the, the term of the fat. I'm sure you know it. So, so the healthy fats are good, but the unhealthy fats, no. And then salt. Now are we talking like, you know, Himalayan sea salt? Are we talking iodized salt? Does it matter? Just any kind of salt whatsoever is gonna, is gonna cause constriction? Well, put it this way, Let, let's say you and your partner cook something at home, you control the amount of salt that goes in there. If you're not getting something that's processed or coming, you know, out of a box, if you go to a restaurant, you have no control over that. And things are, you would be amazed at how much salt gets added to your food when you go out to a restaurant because it tastes good. You know, we, our bodies like it. We've been, you know, we've been conditioned to like the, the flavor of it. And that same thing with fat and the same thing with sugar. So um, so if I, if you're cooking at home, yeah, add a little bit of the Himalayan sea salt, which ha brings in some minerals with it. Um, and you, you're fine, but just be really, really wary, especially of processed foods, things that come in a can, things, things that come in a box and definitely things that you eat out. So it sounds like maybe like for date night, instead of going to a conventional restaurant and going to either like a healthy restaurant or just cooking at home so that you can monitor what you're putting in your body. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, in the book, I have a whole date night sex menu. So you can kind of pick and choose from the foods that actually showed in research to have some measurable affect, um, you know, measurable improvements uh, to either, you know, hormonal or, or vascular uh, function in the short term. So um, the thing about it is, though, um, we might think that this is, it, it typically is a fairly subtle effect, you know, one meal is not going to turn around your sex life, you know, but um, it is surprising that even one serving of spinach in research showed to increase salivary nitric oxide by eight times baseline. So spinach is pretty powerful. You know, these, these high um, nitrate foods, they do measurably, you know, dilate blood vessels. It's definitely significant, 
But again, for long-term sexual health, we want to be eating consistently healthy and, and have better food choices. Yeah, and it sounds like this this would be a really really supportive information for people who suffer from chronic dysfunction. So whether it's like you mentioned, men suffering from chronic erectile dysfunction, or for uh, people with vulvas and vaginas suffering from low libido or lack of engorgement or lack of sensation and orgasmia, have you found any any uh, dietary support in terms of um, uh, vaginismus and and painful sex? No, I have not. Uh, you know what? I'm. I haven't. I had didn't come across any research that supported any kind of dietary intervention at all. Um, the only thing that I do think of, um, though, is that any kind of muscle contraction and release relies very much on potassium, magnesium, and calcium. And so, what I'm thinking is that if I were to to create a dietary strategy, I would I would be wanting to increase those the intake of both. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And so in your book, you, you mentioned that you have a diet for, for great sex and like a meal plan. How did you, is that, is that accurate? And if so, how did you create this meal plan for us? <laughs> so I basically just used all the research I came across along with, you know, kind of the wisdom of traditional Chinese dietetics. So, um, so that's, you know, that's, that's basically it. In the, in the book, all of the recommendations, none of them have meat, so it's consistent with a um, plant-based diet, but I don't recommend necessarily against eating meat. Uh, you know, meat can bring something to the table, certainly a, a very bioavailable form of zinc, for example. But, um, you know, I, I in, in traditional Chinese medicine, um, it's not advised to stop eating meat because it's considered to be a blood tonic, but they wouldn't have eaten the huge amount of meat that we eat in our diets today. So that's why all of the recipes are just giving an alternative to that. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a whole, you know, seven days of breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, examples. And there's also recipes to go along with them. So um, yeah, and they're delicious recipes. So how much meat would be recommended from the viewpoint of, uh, of traditional Chinese medicine? Well, a typ typically, um, a diet would consist, you know, a traditional Chinese diet would consist of rice, lots of vegetables, and then a little bit of meat as a more of a flavoring, you know, so just enough to give it some flavor. Yeah. Okay. So not like the main meal, because in the West here, the North American diet is like meat is the center, and then everything else is kind of a constellation around the meat. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's more of a, the 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 it's not the centerpiece of the meal for sure mm -hmm. so it would be like the centerpiece so the emphasis should be more on like the leafy greens the veggies that sort of thing maybe some meat on the side and then what is the view on different starches so i know you mentioned rice for for traditional chinese medicine but what what about other like what is the view on bread what is the view on you know white roasted potatoes and that sort of thing <laughs> Okay, so potatoes do get a bad rep, but in fairness, we do kind of, um, we grease them up, we fry them, we salt them, we do everything to them. And then we, oh, and we take out the best part, which is the skin, you know, about 40% of the minerals are in the skin. So um, a baked potato with the skin on it is a great source of potassium. And quite honestly, there are, there's not a long list of foods that are good sources of potassium. Most of us don't get enough of it in our diets. I actually read one study that said it was like 97% of Americans don't get enough potassium. You actually have to really make a conscious effort to get enough of this in your diet. So a potato with, um, with the skin on it, not only does it have a lot of vitamin C, which is our antioxidant, uh, it also has potassium, it also has magnesium. So it actually brings a lot to the table. White rice, on the other hand, brings very little to the table. So it, it brings very little to, to sexual health. Um, other carbs, uh, squash is a really good one because again, you've got a, it's a good source of potassium. Yams, are again, really good, good carb source. Peas are a really good carb. Um, you know, the more refined, the generally the, the less it brings to sexual health. What about, um, what about grains like short grain brown rice or quinoa or barley, that sort of thing? So again, those can have a lot of nutritional value to bring to the table. 
Um, most of the research that I came across was, most of my research in the book focuses more on fresh fruits and vegetables, just because that's where the research lies. There's not a lot of research that says that barley is good for sex. So I didn't include that in the book, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So we should maybe do an experiment to find out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> barley every night for seven nights. See what happens. <laughs> Your lab rats. <laughs> so, so let's say our listeners out there, they they have a, a diet that's the trifecta of bad sex, which is <laughs> salt and sugar. And they, they take, you read your book and they take it on. They're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make these changes. How long uh, do, do we need to clean things up in order to start seeing changes in, in the bedroom? Honestly, it depends on baseline. Mm-hmm. So again, those, it depends on how occluded um, those arteries are. If your arteries are only just starting to become, uh, you know, blocked with plaque, I would say you're going to notice results a lot quicker. But with, you know, even I've seen patients see results within a week or two, you know, and the longer they do it, the better the results that they get. So, I mean, something like balancing your hormones, um, you know, strengthening nerve conduction, all those things, some of them can take time, but you you definitely get some immediate benefits to that. Um, so, uh, if you're, if you have longstanding cardiovascular disease, it's going to take a little bit more time to, to see results. The cool thing about that though, is that, um, you know, cardiovascular disease was long thought to be chronic and irreversible, meaning all that plaque accumulation, you can't get rid of it. But now there's, there are new studies coming out saying that spinach is something that can reverse some of that plaque accumulation. So, um, load up on spinach, eat lots of it. And especially if that's, you know, if you're trying to address cardiovascular health, then that's one of the things you really want to focus on. Now, again, is this spinach raw or is it cooked? Because I believe I've read that eating raw spinach is not the best thing. Well, there's different studies. It depends on if you're, if you're going to drink the water that you cook it from. So if you steam spinach and you drink the water, some of that, those minerals are going to go into the water. Another way to do it is, or like kale, for example, kale is another powerhouse of antioxidants. Make yourself a nice little, um, you know, stew or whatever. That's the whole kind of purpose of soup. If you steam vegetables, a lot of those minerals go in the water, but if you make a soup out of it, you retain everything that kind of fell out of it, you know? Beautiful. But then of course you got to, you got to make it a low salt kind of soup. A low salt kind of soup, but it is, it is okay to eat these raw. Like if I want to have a kale and spinach salad kind of thing for just a super high dose of antioxidants, that'll work too. Yeah. Yeah. Everything I've seen says, says, yes, it's okay. Um, there are, there are, there is some reason to believe that in, in some cases, um, steaming, uh, vegetables can make certain nutrients more bioavailable. Okay. Um, and then, but then other nutrients were shown to be more bioavailable raw. So I would say eat both. You know, if you can have with your dinner, you have some steam vegetable with lunch, you have a nice raw leafy green salad. Well, this makes me really excited because we are planning our gardens for the summer. And like, we've got like a eight foot box and I'm like, that's the greens box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like go crazy with the spinach, go crazy with the kale. Like that is, that is the bomb. So we're going to have like the good sexual health garden here. Yeah. Great. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> so, so, so we've talked about diet to address dysfunction. What about if our sex lives are always, are already rocking? What if our sex lives are already good? Will changing our diet or improving our diet in these ways, will that improve our sexual experience? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because Again, who can, who, who's nerved fire too strong? Uh, you know, who, who has too good of nerve conduction? Whose erections are too strong? You know, who had, I mean, everyone knows what it's like to have clitoral engorgement when you're 17 versus when you're 40. And no matter how well you take care of your body, there's a difference there. So, um, yeah, it absolutely makes a difference, even if you're having great sex as it is. But the other thing to think about is this. Right now, we are exposed to more pesticides and environmental toxins than ever before. And there's very, very clear research that it very much does 
um, affect our hormones. It disrupts hormones and definitely sex hormones. It does slow nerve conduction because it causes oxidative damage to our nerves. And you can address this with your diet. I mean, not to 100% for sure, but um, antioxidants, for example, offset that oxidative damage um, by, you know, our environmental toxins. And then increasing things like magnesium, calcium intake, that was shown in research to um, minimize absorption of some of these toxic chemicals that we're exposed to. So the better, you know, your, your mineral profile in your diet, the less of these toxic heavy metals your body will absorb when you're exposed to them, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And, and what are your thoughts on supplements? Because, you know, you can take magnesium before bed or whatever, or like I have a whole food green drink that I take every day. So can we, can we support, um, uh, what, well, just what are your thoughts on supplements to support? So my thoughts on this are, you know, caution. Um, I, I would be very cautious about taking minerals in isolation because of the fact that they compete with one another. So for example, uh, you know, taking calcium can kind of sabotage your, you know, your iron stores or your magnesium stores. You know, taking magnesium can do the opposite. Um, taking zinc can can compromise your magnesium. Um, they all kind of compete for binding sites in the body. So if you're going to take a broad mineral supplement, supplement that's fine. I think that's that's great. Don't take just calcium though, or don't take just magnesium because that you might be um, doing more harm than good. Yeah. Okay. So something more broad spectrum. Cause I mean, ultimately like, it's not like, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, we had vitamin stores to help us supplement our diet. We were getting all of the nutrition and all of the, the minerals that we needed from the food that we ate. That's really the way our bodies are designed. So supplements are like, because our food isn't as healthy as it used to be. It sounds like. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is, uh, I, I, I have a, um, a, an affinity for Chinese medicine and I've studied Tibetan medicine and I've dabbled in a little bit in traditional Chinese medicine and, um, and then also Taoism in terms of sexuality. So I had never heard the concept that, that in traditional Chinese medicine, they encourage you to not have lots of sex. Is that correct? Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, so yeah, I talked about this in my book. The, the current kind of predominant um, consensus in, among traditional Chinese medical practitioners is that having too much sex, particularly for males, will um, deplete the essence. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in my book, I explore this too. This was not always the, um, the philosophy at all. As a matter of fact, if you go back, you know, to, you know, certain empires like pre- um, Pre-Confucianism, you'll see that sex was thought to nourish the essence in both males and females. And so emperors, for example, they would have, you know, dozens and dozens of concubines. And what they would do is they were, their vaginal secretions were thought to provide their partner with precious jing or vital life essence. And so the emperor would build his jing with all of his concubines. And then only on the full moon, he would have sex with the empress. And he was it was considered that his jing was so strong from nourishing it with all these concubines that he would produce a very small, a very smart, healthy heir with the empress by doing so. So he was encouraged to have lots and lots and lots of sex. Um, and but then that changed with Confucianism. But that was also a time when there was increasing kind of government control in every you know, aspect of life because you know, the, um, these, these empires were struggling to uh, maintain control. And a lot of times they were getting overthrown. And so they, they just attempted to just have more and more control over the people in an effort to stay in power. So that in, even included in their private lives and their sexual lives. And part of that was they used Confucianism as a way to control um, the people and part of the ideas of Confucianism were um, more, you know, temperate with, with regard to, to sexual behavior. 
And what about um, semen retention? Is, is any of that included in uh, Chinese medicine? Because that is a technique that we, we practice and we teach in separating orgasm from ejaculation so that men can have um, non-ejaculatory orgasms, as many as they want, and not suffer that, that feeling of loss or depletion that comes with frequent ejaculation. Are there, is there any discourse on that in Chinese medicine? Yeah, absolutely. And so if a, if a male were to conserve his ejaculate, it was thought to then be able to travel along the spine and nourish his brain. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the, as you, I'm sure know, the female manifestation of essence is the menses and the male manifestation of, of it's the embodiment of essence is semen. So you're, you would be losing a little bit of your essence every time one would ejaculate. And I know I, I have friends who are also practitioners who swear by this, that, you know, excessive masturbation or excessive, um, you know, ejaculation will cause disease. Um, but again, that wasn't always the case. That's more, you know, uh, that again, that wasn't in ancient China. That was in like you know, less uh, or more modern uh, Chinese history. Mm -hmm. So then how does Chinese medicine currently promote good sexual health? What are the recommendations? So, so it's all about maintaining the free flow of qi and blood. There are things that block the qi and blood, like rich, heavy, um, you know, cloying foods, we call them. And then there are things that, you know, pr that, that promote the free flow of chi and blood. And so a healthy diet that promotes, promotes this, this um, you know, chi and blood is one that balances the five flavors. And so the five basic flavors should be represented kind of equally in the diet. And these are, you know, bitter, sour, sweet, salty. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting one, but the, the ones that are re represented too much in the diet are the sweet flavor and the salty flavor for sure. So we, with all the processed food, they load it with that stuff. What's not represented as well is the bitter flavor. And the bitter flavor clears heat in the body. The bitter flavor um, is of the heart. And so in, in bitter is the flavor of leafy greens. And so that again, is another reason to improve, increase your, your leafy greens. That is good to know. So, so I'd wondered where the bitter came from. And in, in, uh, in Tibetan medicine, there's my body type is particularly prone to enjoying sour things. So I've noted that I'm like, oh, yeah, I really do enjoy uh, lots of sour things. So I was wondering where the bitter thing was, because that helps balance the sour if, if, if there's an over, over whatever of, of sour uh, in your diet. So it's nice to know that the leafy greens provide the bitter. Um, and I think the other one might yeah. be savory. Would that be correct? savory uh no no nope. there's uh let me see the heart is bitter the lungs oh acrid that's what i forgot acrid so you're talking about your ginger your garlic yeah oh i love those too all right yay so so it sounds like like death to the sex drive is processed foods that and and that's like yeah a, kind of <laughs> absolutely a, a mainstay of a con of what we call a conventional Western diet is really heavy in the processed foods. So for people to make the switch to whole foods, leafy greens, as you're saying, salads, like unprocessed food is moving in the right direction to support our overall health. And if our overall health is good, then our, then our sexual health is going to be uh, way better. Absolutely. Yeah, you got it right. That's, that, that's the key is, um, you know, just, trying to eat as close to mother nature. I mean, the way human beings were uh, intended to, to eat. Yeah. Yeah. Not boxed pizza, though. I do like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not on date night. <laughs> not on date night. So your book again is diet for great sex. Yes. And where could we find this amazing manifesto? It's on amazon.com or it's on Amazon. And um, you can also find me on Diet for, diet for great sex.com. And I'm also on social media under the same name. And so for some of our listeners who are listening online and, and all over the world, if they're having issues with sexual functioning, or they want some support to change their diet, to uh, improve their health and wellness, do you work online? Where are you located? How can people work with you? 
I'm, uh, I'm in Rochester, New York, and I do have a private practice here. I have not treated anybody um, long distance, but I'm open to it. You know, if they wanted to contact me, I, I'd certainly be, be open to that. You can contact me through my website. Okay. And your website again? dietforgreatsex.com dietforgreatsex.com okay just one that's just one thing dietforgreatsex.com and it sounds like in lieu of that get the book and learn and read and then we can become masters of our own sexual well-being yeah absolutely yay awesome well it was so wonderful to speak with you today this is really really pertinent information and it is an area that we do tend to or i not everyone tends to overlook but sometimes i will say that it gets i kind of overlooked and pushed to the side of like conscientiously being mindful about the food that we're eating and how that is impacting our sexual health. And I didn't even have any idea that there were certain foods that could increase engorgement and certain foods that could impede engorgement. So that is really, really important information for all of us to have. So thank you so much for sharing. Is there anything else you want to share with our audience before we go? No, I I mean, just my general philosophy is, you know, be kind, you know, for the best sex, be kind to yourself, be kind to your partners. Yay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you everyone for joining this episode of Sex is Medicine. I hope it was as nutritiously delicious for you as it was for me. Make sure you get this book, uh, Diet for Great Sex, because we all want to optimize our sexual functioning, even if it's already great. Um, Particularly if we're dealing with any issues, it's a wonderful thing to know that just making these subtle changes in our diet um, can support our overall health and well-being. Make sure to stay connected with us at AuthenticTantra.com and Authentic Tantra on all your social media stuff. Uh, Love your comments. Love your questions. Keep them coming. Have a beautiful, beautiful week and we'll see you next week. You've been listening to Sex is Medicine with Davy Ward Erickson, your number one resource for holistic sex education. You can listen to and subscribe to Sex is Medicine on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Just search Sex is Medicine with Davy Ward. Stay connected with me and my guests on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Authentic Tantra and learn how you can use Tantra as medicine to heal, awaken, and empower every area of your life at AuthenticTantra.com. Make sure to tune in to Sex is Medicine every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on Contact Talk Radio Network, and join our watch party every Thursday evening on Facebook at Authentic Tantra. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Sex is Medicine with Davey Warren.